Jai Gurdjieff, Jai Masters. There are lots and lots of techniques that everybody gives you. If they're real, they all lead to the same place. All, the entire spiritual journey is about the same thing. Liberation, freedom, extricating yourself from yourself. What does that mean? The bottom line is as simple. You are conscious, you're aware of things. How many things? Everything. How many things have you been aware of throughout your life? Every single moment, you're aware of things. You're aware of the physical plane, what's going on, taste, touch, smell, sight, hearing. It's just happening. It's just, it's a happening place. And you experience it. Who does? You do. You also experience thoughts. You have thoughts. You've always had thoughts. They change. You don't have the same thoughts that you had when you were five. You don't have the same thoughts you had when you were five years ago. You probably don't have the same thoughts that you had one minute ago. They just change. They change. You have emotions. You're aware of emotions. Correct? So you're conscious. And because you're conscious, you're aware of things. If you were not conscious, nothing would make any difference. It wouldn't even exist if you weren't conscious. You're receiving the outside world, who is you are. You're receiving your thoughts. What do you mean? What do you mean I am receiving my thoughts? Be serious. Every one of you know that. Have you ever said, God, my mind is driving me crazy? Whose mind? My mind is a possessive pronoun. My purse, my car, my house. Does that mean you are the purse, you are the car, you are the house? No, I'm the one who has a car. I'm the one who has a house. I'm the one who has a purse. I'm the one that has a mind. You say it all the time. Your natural language tells you what's going on. If you sit down to meditate, you get up, you say, oh, I had a terrible meditation. I can't meditate. Why? My thoughts won't stop. How do you know? How do you know your thoughts didn't stop? Let's say you have a deep meditation. Sometimes people have deep meditations. Good. Okay, you come back, you say, oh my God, it was so beautiful. My thoughts stopped completely. How do you know? How do you know? There were no thoughts. There were no thoughts at all. How do you know? Well, because I was there. But if you are your thoughts and there were no thoughts, then you're not there. So you're not your thoughts. You're aware of your thoughts. It's that simple. It's not mystical. It's not weird. It's not a philosophy. <laughs> all right? If you have a philosophy, you know your mind has a philosophy. He's challenging my philosophy. Who's doing what to whom? And how do you know? My favorite is when you wake up in the morning and you say, oh my God, I had this amazing dream last night. How do you know? I'm not playing with you. Sure. How do you know you had a dream last night? How do you know you had a dream? Were you there in the dream? Did you say, oh, oh I had this dream and I got married and, and thing and I had some children and so then I started to die but I got better. Who did all this? How do you know? How do you know? Because you're conscious. You're not just conscious of the outside world. You're not just conscious of your th conscious thoughts, thoughts that you have when you're awake. You're not just conscious of your emotions. Can you have emotions in a dream? Can you get scared in a dream? Ever had a nightmare? Scary, isn't it? What do you mean? There's nothing happening. But you're experiencing something, aren't you? The real deep understanding is when you wake up and you say, I had this dream last night. Now I'm scared. Is it the same I? Because you who sit in there being scared and you who is having the dream, you don't have to you know, communicate and text each other, do you? <laughs> it's the same consciousness. It's the same consciousness that's experiencing everything. It's experiencing the world that comes in your senses. It's experiencing the thoughts going on in your mind. Experiencing the emotions when they come up. What if they're bad emotions? You're experiencing them. What if they're good emotions? You're experiencing them. Oh my God, when I saw her, I felt so much love. How do you know? Because I'm in here and this love was in there and I was experiencing it. Right? Then she said something really, really mean and I felt disdain and terrible feelings. How do you know? Was it the same you who felt the love and then felt the terrible feelings? If you just sit here for an hour, I keep talking like this because there's nothing else to teach. Right? You know. Wait, I should have started off. Are you in there? How do you know? Prove it. Don't even try. They have this, I forget the name of the test, but there's this test that they're giving to 
humans who are interacting with AI, with you know computers. There's a name for the test, I forget. And you get a rating as to whether you know you're talking to an artificial intelligence. Okay, let me tell you something. He's not in there. You're in there, he's not in there. He may sound like he's in there, but he ain't in there. Oh. <laughs> There's no one in there, okay? There's just, that's it, okay? So, yes, I can cause you to have certain thoughts. I can say things that make you think certain things. Things can happen in this room that make you think certain things, right or wrong. But you're the one who's experiencing it. You're actually in there. And like I said, the ultimate is dreams. Well, wait, have you ever woken up and said, oh my God, I slept so deep, I didn't have any dreams. Yes or no? How do you know? Just stop. How do you know? How do you know? Because you were still conscious. Right? Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras says the following. When you're awake, you experience your waking mind. When you go to sleep, you experience your dream mind. When you go into deep sleep, it is not that you're not conscious. You're conscious of nothing. Big difference. The consciousness is still there. That's how you know that there were no dreams. That's how you know you went into deep meditation. Because the consciousness never ever isn't there. It is always there. Guess what? It has always been there. Period. Somebody once asked Mayor Baba, great enlightened master, how does they get? They knew who he was. They could feel his energy. They saw he knew everything. They asked him once, once somebody asked him, Baba, who are you? Who are you? You know what he said? I was in the beginning before all else was created. I will be in the end after all else falls away. There was never a time I was not, and there will never be a time I will not be. That is true of you. Consciousness has absolutely nothing to do with what it's conscious of. No more than a light shining on an object has anything to do with that object. If you take the object away, light is still there. If you move the light to another object, it's the same light. Consciousness has nothing to do with the object of consciousness. You who's aware of the car have nothing to do with the car. You're just aware of it. Well, you're aware of your thoughts. You're aware of your emotions. You're aware of your dreams. You're aware of whatever you're aware of. Those are objects of consciousness. The things you're conscious of. If a light is shining on an object for 7,000 years and has moved off, the light did not change one single iota. It did not take any of the qualities of the object that shined on, right or wrong. It is what we call transcendent to the object. Light is transcendent to the object it is shining on. And your consciousness is always, at all times, period, your consciousness is transcendent to anything it is aware of. Well, it doesn't feel that way. You don't write it, doesn't feel that way. But it is that way. It is that way. You're the highest being that walked the face of the earth. Christ said, my father and I won. That is true of you, period. The truth is, people say, you know, sincere people doing spiritual practices, right? I, I want to go back to God. I want to merge with God. Listen to me. You are already there. You have never left. If I'm sitting here in this chair and I look at that picture over there, did I have to leave the chair to look at the picture? I'm aware of the picture. I didn't leave. Why? Awareness has the ability, like a light, right? If I have a light shining, it illuminates the picture, but it doesn't have to leave here, does it? Consciousness has a center. It's center of consciousness. From that center, it projects its awareness. I can see across the field. I don't have to go there. Consciousness is able to expand or contract. I can focus on something. My consciousness is totally focused on one thing. I can expand my consciousness by not focusing it. If I look at the whole room, I see the room. If I look at her nose, I see her nose. Consciousness is focused on whatever it focuses on. But it has nothing to do with it. Nothing. So at this very moment, your consciousness is that which they speak of. Universal. Absolute. Made in the image of God. That's where it is. From there, just like from this chair, I'm looking at the picture, from that seat of absolute unity, what Mary Robbins said, you will never die, you were never born, you are everywhere, omnipresent at all times, omnipotent, omniscient, aware of, that's you, that's you, right? But you're focusing on your thoughts, your body, and your mind, your heart, your emotions. 
How much are you focused on it? You are addicted to it, right? You are fixated. You have never been off it. Do you understand the difference? It's not like I have to go somewhere. You're there. You have to stop leaving. That's the real teachings. Not I have to go to God. I have to stop leaving God. I have to find love. You have to stop leaving love. I have to find joy and happiness. You have to stop leaving joy and happiness. How am I leaving it? By focusing on something else. You're focusing on something other than your seat of being, who you are. That's how they talk about it. It's about just being. You're there right now. I guarantee you, you're there right now. Where the highest, where Christ was. You're there right now. And you know what? He said that. That which I am, so also you. As I sit by the throne, as the seat of consciousness, as I sit by the throne of my Father, so you should sit by my throne. And these things that I do should do these and even greater things. It means just what it says. That thou art. In the yoga tradition, right? We have mantras that are very, very high, the highest mantras. Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahma. I am the one. I am the absolute. Shiva Ham. I am Shiva. Ham Sa. I am he. Just, I mean, every one of those great mantras that were given by the masters were speaking from where they were. I am merged with the universe. That's who I am. That's who you are. Okay? But you are looking down at an object of consciousness. Which one? Your thoughts, your emotions, what's coming in through your eyes, your nose, your ears, and you are completely fixated at staring at that. Try to get off. You can't. I tried to meditate and my thoughts were blah, 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 blah. I, I thought I loved her so much and then she said something and then this happened. That you're just caught in this tiny little spot. You know how small that spot is? You're standing in one spot on a planet Earth. That's pretty small to start with. Like what percentage of planet Earth you're taking up right now? Okay, let's not discuss it. All right? And you're watching your thoughts. Are you watching her thoughts? No, you're watching your thoughts. Are you capable Literally, is consciousness capable of being conscious of those thoughts instead of yours? Completely, utterly, not even. That's like saying, am I capable of not staring at that picture, but looking at that one? Of course, I'm going to just stop focusing my consciousness on somewhere. If you stopped focusing your consciousness on your thoughts, you see thoughts. They're everywhere. There's things in the universe, thoughts. Psychics can see thoughts. You know that? Okay, people. You, you've been sitting in a car and had a thought about something you haven't thought of for five years, and the person next to you said, have you ever thought of this? Yes or no? Okay? Phone rings. It's your sister from Europe. Oh, my God, I literally was just thinking of calling you this very second. Yes, ever happened? They're everywhere. It's everywhere. Stop it. I, it's a, I, I won't even answer a question. How did that happen? Is it a miracle? No, how does it not happen is the question. How is it that you don't see anything but that one picture? Because that's what you're staring at. And if you stare at it, that's all you see. Not because that's all there is. That's all you see. Ever walk into a room and you know people are fighting? Ever walk into a room, you know people are just filled with love with each other, but they're hiding it? Yes or no? Can you feel other people's emotions? Do places have emotions? Can you walk into a place and it feels really holy and high and special? And another place you walk into is yicky. You are capable of feeling things other than yourself. You don't ever do it. You are completely fixated on yourself. And we talk about meaning of life. When people ask the meaning of life, I like to talk about what you know is not the meaning of life. Like you don't know the meaning of life, but you know what is not the meaning of life. Is an ant the meaning of life? Is that why I'm here? Is that everything? There's a stupid ant sitting over there. Well, there's many other things beside the ant, so it can't be the meaning. You are staring at, I started telling you, Something so small, it is standing in one spot on the planet Earth, which is so tiny, and you're not even paying attention to that spot. You're paying attention to just your thoughts and your emotions and what you think about that spot and whatever you can see. I like it. I don't like it. It's pretty. It's attractive. It's repulsive. Your thoughts, your emotions, and the little tiny air that you take up. I can't get through a talk without telling you this because you have to know this. Not only is your spot on that planet Earth one trillionth of the spots on the planet Earth, but 1.3 million Earths fit inside the sun. 1.3 million Earths fit inside the sun. And the sun is one of 300 billion stars in your galaxy. And there are two trillion galaxies, all with hundreds of billions of stars. How important are you? 
It's beyond zero. That's an insult to zero to say zero. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Well, at least zero is there. You know, there's a number. You can use it, all right? Give me a break. You will never understand the meaning of life or anything until your consciousness is willing to understand the breadth and scope of everything more than you. Because it's not about you. How can it be about you? Wait, are you here today, gone tomorrow? Yes or no? You can stay here? Been here a long time? 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years, right? Earth itself, which like I told you, 1.3 billion fins out of the sun is nothing, right? Has been here for 4.5 billion years. How long are you going to be here? In other words, you wake up and you realize, I am conscious, and what I'm conscious of is nothing. And I'm trying to make a big deal out of it. (laughs) Why? Now we'll get down to business, what I really want to talk about. Now that we've laid the groundwork, why, if my consciousness, first question, if my consciousness is capable of experiencing the universe, I'm God's consciousness, there is only one consciousness, period consciousness and you're it go to the ocean and take a little teaspoon somewhere go to another place teaspoon it's all the ocean isn't it consciousness is consciousness there is nothing different about it other than what it stares at so the nature of consciousness is awareness and your awareness is the same as her awareness same with your awareness it's just what you're aware of is different so what's this all about why don't I know who I am? Why am I so lost? What's going on? What's going on is as follows. You're in there, and consciousness has the ability of focusing on things, but it's not always by choice. Is it not true that your consciousness gets distracted by a loud noise or a bright light or somebody's words? Or Does your consciousness get distracted? Or do you always decide where you want to put your consciousness? You just decide. I want to put my consciousness over there. There's seven billion dollars sitting over there. I'm going to put over her little color. Over there. There's somebody naked running around over there. I'm not going to look over here. <laughs> you don't stand a chance. You go to a party, all right? You put you on anywhere you want. There's food, there's architecture, there's music. She's wearing the same blouse as me. That, oh, my God. They told me this was a unique blouse. That's all you'll see. When somebody asked her, how was the party? She was wearing the same blouse. <laughs> okay. I like that you laugh, but isn't it true? Is it true or not? Okay? This is what it means to seek reality. Be real. Talk about it. Okay? What's that all about? What happens is consciousness can get distracted. And when it gets distracted, what it got distracted by is the only thing it experiences. What does it mean in psychology to be fixated on something? Or to have a trauma. Right? Hear me? A traumatic experience. It means it left an impression in your mind that your consciousness can't get off of. It always comes back. It just keeps creating thoughts at night, during the day, okay? Same thing. Same thing as if she's wearing the same blouse. It distracted you. That thought distracted you, and now you stare at it, and you can't get your consciousness off of it. Now, notice that word. You can't get your consciousness. Of course you can get your consciousness off of it. Just move it off of it. Not so easy. It's like a drug addict. I can't get off of drugs. Well, of course you can get off of drugs. Not easy. But of course you can get off of drugs. I can't stop smoking. I'm, I'm, I'm the verge of cancer. And they told me I better stop smoking, but I can't. Really? That's not a true statement. You don't want to. You don't know how to. I can understand all that. But don't you dare say, I can't. Well, it's the same thing with your consciousness being absorbed, distracted, fixated, addicted to your thoughts. We talked about trauma, that's the one strong thought. You are addicted to what's called your self-concept. Psychology will agree with me, but they don't go back to the consciousness. They just talk about the structure in the mind, okay? What is, what is a self-concept? There are events that have come in through your senses throughout your life. Some of them were pleasant. Some of them were very, 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 very unpleasant. And others were white lines on the road. <laughs> they came and went. They didn't do anything, Okay. Which ones are left inside of you? The very, very unpleasant ones and the ones that were very, very pleasant. Why? Do you think the atoms that made up the pleasant ones and the atoms that made up the unpleasant ones are any different? They're still in the periodic table. They're just exactly the same. Okay? Why? How come it stayed inside your mind? Because you did that. I always teach you this. You held it in there. It happened. You weren't comfortable with it. 
consciousness has a power. We'll talk about natures of consciousness maybe by the end, right? There's a power of consciousness. The truth is, I already told it to you, consciousness can focus. If you take a magnifying glass and hold it up to the sun, the light is everywhere, isn't it? Hold the magnifying glass up. It'll burn whatever it's shining on. Why? Because it focused. It focused the power. There was, wasn't any added power. How come it doesn't burn me? Because it's not focused. How come when I walk out there? But if I hold the magnifying glass, don't you? Well, I don't want you shining, burning me up. Consciousness is the same. When consciousness focuses, there's a power. The power of focus. You want to know what that is? You have a word for that. You know what the word is? Will. That is what will is. The power of consciousness focused. Do you have the power of will? If a thought comes inside of you, somebody says something or does something, and it's not comfortable inside of you, can you push it away? Can you keep it so it doesn't come all the way in and you become overwhelmed by it? Do you protect yourself? With what? With will. You have power in there, don't you? That's what willpower is. All right. So if you learn nothing else, that's a real neat thing to know. So when you focus on something, you are pushing your power of will, and consciousness is tremendous power, power of will onto it. When you don't like it when it comes in, you do it all the time. You don't, you don't notice. When you don't like it when it comes in, you don't want it coming in further. You don't want it coming all the way back to you, the consciousness, the seat of consciousness. Therefore, you use your will to push it away. Like Freud talked about, I love Freud. He says, how deep, yogis are deeper than Freud. Freud talked about suppression and repression, but he didn't talk about who's doing it. He said, you can take thoughts and experiences and push them away into your subconscious. Didn't he say that? Who's doing that? You are, aren't you? You know you are. I didn't just tell you something you don't know. You don't like something, you push it away. You, not, a person you can push away, a thing you can push away, that's outside. You can do it inside, can't you? You can push that thought away. Where does it go? That's what Freud said. It gets stuck inside. It stays inside. For how long? Does psychology say that when they take your blanket away too soon, when you're two, that's still bothering you when you're 50? Oh. Or if you got divorced 10 years ago, and you're in America, but now you're traveling in Europe, and his name was Ben, and all of a sudden at a party, and somebody, Ben, Ben, does your heart go, yes or no? What's that telling you? It's still in there. Why is it still in there? You pushed it away. What if I didn't push it away? It's not in there. White lines, trees, cars, you drive by, they're not in there. Hypnosis says that they really are in your memory. They can be brought back right? They do that. You know, they do that. Okay. But they're not caught inside. They're stored properly in proper memory. So the computer has memory, but it doesn't pop up and haunt you all the time. But those things that didn't make it through because you resisted them, they're stuck inside. That's what's going on. And guess what? They're very distracting. Why? Because they're exactly the ones that distracted you before. You couldn't handle their energy when they came in. Therefore, when you push it away, if anything reminds you of it, if a billboard or somebody's cooking in the kitchen, reminds your mother, or clothes, anything, a word, the way it's said, bam, that starts coming back up. And it distracts your consciousness. That's why you can't get your consciousness off of you. Because what you've done, which is just amazing, is you've built in your mind a house that your consciousness is locked into. It won't let go because it's distracted by it. At any moment, it keeps pulling it down into that. That house you built is different than the house somebody else built. Why? You've had different experiences and you reacted to them differently. The ones that your house is built out of are the ones that bothered you or the ones that you really liked. I'm the one that fell in love with so-and-so and and it was so beautiful. On the honeymoon, I did this and I did that. That's who you are. That's what you experienced. Stop defining yourself as an experience you had. What, would you not exist if you didn't have the experience? Well, of course you would. You just have different experiences. You are the consciousness that's experiencing what's coming through your senses. Fine. Have a good time. Enjoy it. It's wonderful. It keeps changing. It's very entertaining, isn't it? But it's also very distracting if you don't like it. Now, that's really what I wanted to talk about. When things come in from outside... Do they feel different inside? 
Can they make you feel different inside? It happens all the time, all right? It's not that you don't like or do like the outside. None of you could care one squat about anything outside. Not one of you. You care about how it makes you feel inside. If the same thing outside made you feel different inside, you would deal with it totally differently, wouldn't you? You do it with your relationship all the time. You were really nice to me, and you did what I wanted, and you, you were loyal. That's just wonderful. I feel so close to you. You did what? I didn't know you did that. Well, how you feel? Okay? You literally get married and divorced based on what effect the outside has on the inside. You only care about the inside. It's terrible, isn't it? You only care about the inside. And if something outside makes you feel different inside, makes you feel good inside, you like it. If something outside makes you feel terrible inside, you do not like it at all. And you build your concept of self out of that. That's what a self-concept is. Now, psychology says man is the sum of learned experiences. It's not true. You are the conscious that's aware of your learned experiences. That's true. You understand the difference, right? It's not true that you are the sum of your learned experiences. That's ridiculous. If you didn't have experience, you wouldn't exist. You're in there existing, having the experience. But then what you're doing is clinging to some, that's what Buddhists call it. Which ones do you cling to? The ones you like. If you like it, I don't want it to go away. Okay? I met you. It was so wonderful in the supermarket. Our carts bumped into each other. It was like it was love at first sight. Where are you going? No, stay here. And then even if he or she goes away, the thought does not go away. I can't get him out of my mind. I keep thinking about it. It was so beautiful. I can't wait to see him again. Well, when you're doing that, you're missing every other experience in your life. You're busy experiencing what already happened. And you build the thing inside your mind that it's still happening to you, even though it's not happening anymore. I mean, it may be an hour or two, it might. But right now, it's not happening, is it? There's all kinds of other things happening, but not to you. Because you're busy, you held on. It's what Buddha's calling clinging. You clung to that thought pattern that came in, that, that experience inside. You kept it in your mind. And when something you don't like it, you push it away. In both cases, they stay inside. In yoga, we call them samskaras impressions that didn't make it through. You see all kinds of things all day. They come in and they pass through. You don't hold on to all of them, but you do some of them, and they're still there 10 years, 20 years, 30, 40. Hey, how many of you still have issues with your parents? <laughs> Thank you. Okay? You're not with your parents anymore. You went to college. You went off and this and that, right? There are people 50, 60 years old that can't go home and visit their parents because of what happened when they were five. <laughs> I'll never forget what you did. I can't talk about it. I know you can't talk about it. I don't want to talk to you about it, but boy, it's in there. And I, I don't. So that's psychology, that whole world of the house you built inside out of your thoughts. They're not events. The events are over. You know how it's supposed to be? If it's not happening outside, it's not happening inside. Be here now. That's what that means. But because you're there then, okay, what do you mean there then? All the junk that happened to you before that you kept inside, that's where you are. You're totally distracted by the garbage that you stored inside of you, okay? Well, what about nice things? Isn't it nice to store nice things? Now, to be careful, because sometimes I'm too strong for you, all right? Yes, compared to storing yicky things, nice things are nicer to store. They're just as much of a problem in terms of spirituality. Just as much of a problem. Why? Watch what happened, all right? When I was in high school, in this 10th grade, I met somebody, and she was so beautiful, so special, and she treated me so special. And then her parents, she moved away, and I never got to see her again. Now, every single person I meet since then, I compare them against her. Or the color of her hair, of her hair. If your hair's like hers, right away, man, you get a chance, right? And if you have an accent like she did, what are you doing? In other words, you ruined your life when you were in tenth grade. <laughs> you can't experience anything anymore. You can't have a pure experience. You understand that? You're comparing everything to that. That's what positive experiences do. They ruin your life. Why? <laughs> because you didn't. How do you know there can't be a nicer experience? You'll never find out. Go to a restaurant, have a good meal. Go back when it's not the same chef, the same special, the same thing. You can compare. That was better last time. Portions were bigger. You didn't even give it a chance. You didn't even do it. You, won't, you will not give it a chance. You want it to be the same. Go to Hawaii. Have a wonderful time. Okay? Then go to Hawaii when the volcano's happening or the hurricane's happening. No, you don't have to go that bad. Just go to Hawaii and it's not the same as last time. The hotel's not quite as nice, so you don't think so anyway. How do you know it's not as nice? 
Somebody else went to the hotel. They wrote up on it, you know, those blogs. They wrote, oh, it was the best hotel I was ever at. It was so beautiful. And, and you know, they say, well, it was better last time. You're comparing. From then on, you're caught in your mind and can't have a real experience. So you have built a self-concept about what you like and what you dislike. And now when you look out into the world, if it's the way you built you don't like, you're in trouble. It doesn't feel good inside. If it looks familiar to that which made you feel good, you, you want to go after it. And now you're just running around based on your past. That's what karmic seeds do. <laughs> That's another way to talk about some scars, right? People totally misunderstand karma. It's not a punishment. It's not you did something wrong and you're going to pay for it. It's that basically you did something, it left an impression inside of you. You hurt somebody, it left an impression inside of you. Now you're afraid to talk to them. Now it's, don't say, that's your karma. No, it's the fact that you stored this stuff inside of you. If you didn't store it inside of you, you can see the person next time and be friends and, and be fine. But you can't. If you think you hurt them and you think they don't like you, you have this stuff you carry inside. And therefore, the world is going to look like that. And it's going to be like that. It will be that way because you're looking through your aura. You're looking through your self-concept. So basically, the stuff that you... Let's stay with it didn't like. It's easier to talk about. And plus, 99% of it is the stuff. You, you wish you had as many nice things as not nice things. So basically, you push them away, and they stay inside. So we've already talked about consciousness. We've talked about the power of consciousness, being will. And then we talked about the fact that if it comes in, it has a vibration that you don't feel comfortable with. You push it away. Therefore, it's still there. That's what's so stupid. Why would you want to store what you don't like? In your heart. It is in your heart. You understand that? When you push that down far enough, it's in, it's in your fourth chakra. It's in your heart center. It blocks your love. It blocks everything. But be in love with somebody and have them remind you of your father or mother who you didn't get along with. See how long you love them. Because that stuff's blocking you. It's messing you up. So basically, we talked about distraction. That's what that is. You know what a really big distraction is? Your ego. It's a big distraction. I want this to happen. I don't want that to happen. I can't believe you said that. I'm insulted by that. This is absurd. I can't believe you. I, 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 I. That's why it's always I. That's why it's always I. Because you're distracted by that. And what you mean by the I, what you should mean, is Soham. I am he. No, you mean I am he. I'm that one down there. Instead of the light knowing I am the light, the light is saying, I am that which I'm shining on. That's the fall from the garden. That's the entire mess. That's everything. So basically, now with the consciousness, we have will. We have experiences throughout our lives. We collect the ones we don't like so they're just still inside of us. So they can really bother us really good. And we got them in there and they're very distracting. So that now the world outside, which is innocent, I mean, basically innocent. There's a bunch of atoms moving around. That's all that's out there. Go ask science. A bunch of atoms. And nowadays, if you have a physicist, is it true that there's a bunch of atoms? He says, no, there are no atoms. There are no electron, neutron, protons. There's quarks, leptons, and bosons popping out of an energy field called a quantum field. There's really nothing out there. That's Einstein. E equals MC squared. What is I telling you? There's nothing out there. Matter is energy. Energy is matter. And they're just, they come together, coalesces together. Magnetic fields attract each other and build atoms and build molecules. There's nothing out there. Okay, but when that nothing that's out there comes in, it hits your stuff. It causes vibrations inside and you stored them and so on. So now your consciousness can't return to its seat. Why? Because it's drawn down into what it's distracted by. You are completely, completely distracted by your ego and by your thoughts and by your emotions. Okay, because you're lost in yourself. So now the outside world comes in. You store this stuff inside. Now your consciousness is completely distracted, addicted. I can't even use the right word. You are to yourself way more addicted than any heroin addict is to heroin. They can get off. You can't get off. Try it. Say, you know, your husband or wife comes home and you're looking forward to it, but they're in a bad mood. Happens, right? And they just go into the room and slam the door. How you doing? How you doing? You can't handle it, can you? Well, of course you can handle it. You're on a little planet spinning in the middle of nowhere and nothing happened. <laughs> it's like, right? Nothing happened in the realm of things, did it? And what happened was something in, it was so small I can't even talk about it. One second something happened on a stupid planet, one spot on a planet of which one point, I can't, I'm sorry, I live out there. 1.3 million Earths fit inside the sun and there's 300 billion suns in your galaxy. You want to have fun? 
Use your mind for something functional instead of your personal ego mind that's stored all this garbage. You have an abstract mind. I dare you, when you meditate or times during the day, think of reality instead of yourself. What's reality? 1.3 million Earths inside the sun. Just do that. There's a tiny little piece of dirt in the sun. Then leave the sun. Go out, go out, go out. Go out to where, to where what? To where there are 300 billion stars. And I want you to not be able to find your way back. I hope that scares the hell out of you. How could you find your way back? One out of 300 billion and that little tiny little speck around it? Then leave the galaxy. There's two trillion galaxies. You can't even find your galaxy. I guarantee you. Then get to the point where you realize, that's okay. <laughs> I'm still here. I'm still me. I guess that wasn't me. All that garbage that I stored and thought, I, eventually you'll stop thinking of it. Now you're ready. You got off yourself. That's why they teach you. The Theosophical Society you know, stuff. They, I once read something back in the 70s that said, contemplate only that which is eternal and that which is infinite. That's what I just did for you, right? And what's going to happen? You'll stop being addicted to yourself. And then what will happen? That which happened to the great ones. But you won't have to do any effort. If you're not being drawn down because you're distracted by yourself, what happens? You're not being drawn down. If I'm not fixated on that picture, how hard is it for me to see myself? Nothing. I, I'm not being drawn out of myself. So all of a sudden, consciousness is not being distracted by the garbage this tiny little thing <laughs> called you, and it will naturally float back into its seat of self. If you're not distracted away from yourself, you end up in the self. And that's where the great masters went. That's where the great ones went. They went deep enough to merge. And they all said the same thing of every tradition, right? I am the universe. I am everything. And you can experience that. But you can't while you're experiencing you. How did Christ put it? You must die to be reborn. Now, does that have some meaning to you? That's what he meant. You have to die of the personal, die of being distracted by your personal thoughts <laughs> and emotions and all those things. Oh, but emotions are nice. Yeah, if you want to be human. There are things in the universe. There's rocks, there's, there's dirt, there's stars, there's moons, and there's emotions. You didn't make them, they exist. There's thoughts too, okay? You should and are capable of going out and coming back. You're welcome to come back, right? The great ones... The really great ones go out at will, come back at will. Go out at will, that's called an avatar. And you're talking about high stuff, really high stuff. Somebody once asked Yogananda, he came to America in the 1920s with a turban on his head, he hardly spoke English. Ended up teaching at Carnegie Hall and the lines were five times around the whole building to get in to hear this yogi speak on control of the life force, all right? And there's pictures of the entire Carnegie Hall packed it, and this little guy, he wasn't very tall, the little guy up in the front, right, giving a talk. And somebody once asked Yogananda, you must feel tremendous pride and that, you, that this is happening, you've reached this state. And, and he said, what do you feel when you're standing up there, right? You ready? No, no, I, I don't feel anything like that. When I'm talking, at the same time I'm aware of talking, my consciousness is with my guru who deceased many years ago working at the higher planes with who he's working with, and at the same time, simultaneously, expanding throughout the entire universe at the speed of light. My body's the entire galaxies of everything going on. Those are all happening simultaneously. That's called enlightened. You, did you say you were enlightened? Is that what you said? Don't ever use the word. You get to have an enlightening experience, but that's what an enlightened being is like. That's what the great ones, all right? Like Christ and all the great masters, okay? That's who you are. You're not addicted. You can go and come. Merge back. That's what Christ meant. My Father and I are one. These words that I speak come not from me. Right? When you're done with yourself, you don't have to hang out with yourself. Doesn't mean you can't be here. But what's here now, let's finish off the discussion. Now you're distracted by the collection of some scars, impressions, that you collected over the course of your life because they were either nice or really not nice. And you got those. Now what do you do? What happens now is the world comes in, I don't experience it clean. I experience that it hits my stuff. Don't you? 
I hit my stuff. Then I'm reacting all the time. There's this reaction. I can't believe you said that. I can't believe your glasses look like that. They remind me of my mother, and I didn't like my mother. I did like my mother. And oh my God, look at your necklace. I want one like that. Why can't I have one like that? It's a constant thing. It hits your stuff, and therefore it goes like that. Do you like it when it hits the bad stuff? Do you like feeling yicky? How many of you like feeling yicky? All right, so what do you do? The only thing you know to do is to control the outside world so it doesn't hit your stuff. I can't believe you said that. Don't say that. You ever said it again? I'm out of here. Right? You're not to say that. I told you to not talk like that to me. What are you saying? I can't handle what you said. Therefore, you're not going to say it. Why? Because I can't handle it. In other words, I'm going to spend the rest of my life protecting myself from myself. Aren't you? I'm going to try and get outside what makes me feel good inside. And I'm trying to avoid outside. How about I say it that way? Do any of you ever try to get outside what makes you feel good inside? Do any of you ever try to avoid outside what makes you feel bad inside? <laughs> That's a funny question, isn't it? That's all that's going on. That's why it's such a mess. There's a lot of things going on in the world now. They're not really nice. And there always was, always will be, maybe, I don't know. But and people write me, how do I handle these things? Understand what is happening. You start by understanding. That's all that's happening. Is there are people who have concepts and views and opinions and preferences and hopes and dreams and fears, and they're different than yours. Everyone had different experiences. Therefore, everybody has a different thing going on inside. Everyone. Even your husband. Even your children. Even you, three years ago or five minutes ago, have something different going on inside. So what happens when these things, if, I, if I'm going to run a world, or try to run the world with my will, outside will, using my will, right, to manipulate the moments in front of me, now and who's what's coming, to say, be the way that makes me feel good and don't be the way that makes me feel bad. And we all have totally different feelings and totally different concepts. Well, I wonder what it's going to be like. I don't know, just read the paper. That's why it's that way. And you're no exception. You think you're right. They think they're right. And that they can be anybody. Your thoughts are just the sum of your learned experiences that you stored because they felt good or felt bad. Hey, there are people who do things that would make you disgusted and they love them. There are people who do things that would scare the hell out of you and they run to do them. There are people who don't do things that you would die for. That's how different we are because we're not different at all. We're one, but not what we're looking at ain't, <laughs> okay? The consciousness is staring at a completely different set of opinions and views and likes and dislikes, et cetera, et cetera, because you had different experiences. And therefore, we can't get along. And there's divorces and there's wars and there's terrible things. Now, do you understand? Don't ever say to somebody, how could you do that? You're just showing your ignorance. Because what you're basically saying is, I wouldn't have done that. Well, of course, you wouldn't have done it. You had totally different experiences than me. You grew up in a different place. You had different parents. You had different things. My father had 16,000 guns and yours had none. And we had, we're all different because they had different experiences. That's called Compassion. Now you're talking spiritual. Spiritual is you understand you're caught in yourself and so is everybody else. So don't you dare judge. Christ said, judge not, you should not be judged. Thursday and Patriarch said, to end the burdens and practice of judging. That's why you have no right to judge anybody or anything because you're doing it from your frame of reference. And everybody has a totally different frame of reference. Do you understand that? Doesn't mean they're right. Doesn't mean you're right. There's no right or wrong. There's just this reality I discussed with you. You know what's right? God alone is real. That's what's right. We're all one consciousness with rays of that consciousness staring at all our junk, being distracted by our junk. Okay? So there's truth. So compassion means I understand. It doesn't mean how could you say that? I understand. I understand. You were jealous and you hit somebody. You were jealous and you were scared. You got hurt because you thought I did something and so you ran away. And I, there are people who do things. You do things, right or wrong, except you think you're right. Because based upon your past experiences, it made perfect sense. You can tell people, I know I'm right. Here, I'll give you an example. It's just your mind has those things going on inside. Therefore, all of your evidence says the same thing. It supports what you think, doesn't it? Doesn't it? 
look at these opinions, political positions, and this and that, right? By all means, you know, work with what you need to work with. Nothing wrong. We'll talk about that. Nothing wrong with that. But understand that that other person is just as right as you are from their frame of reference, from where they're looking. A compassionate person understands you are no more right than anybody else. Therefore, you, Christ said, blessed are the peacemakers. That's a peacemaker. Every single person fits inside of you without disgust or attraction. It just is what it is. Okay? If you have trouble with male-female, that's because you have trouble with male-female. God doesn't have any trouble. It's all the same. You have trouble with male and female ants? <laughs> Possums? Okay? No, I have trouble with male and female humans. I'm just another body. All right? Someday you'll get there. Doesn't mean you don't interact. It just means you think you're right. You think you're so strong. Why? Because all your emotions are programmed by your thoughts and your thoughts are programmed by your emotions. It's a conspiracy. Everything inside of you agrees. Does it? Not always, does it? <laughs> it's so funny. It's ridiculous. And in the meantime, it's just consciousness distracted by this psyche. And the psyche was built by the outside world. Therefore, it has this interaction with the outside world. Someday, you will get far enough out to where you feel ecstasy. When? All the time. Why? Because that's who you are. I told you, I talked about the nature of consciousness. Consciousness has a nature, right? Yes, it is awareness. But guess what? It's aware of itself. If it can be aware of other than self, it can be aware of self. And those who were self-realized, you're going to call it self-realization, those who are self-realized all experience the same thing. Bliss, ecstasy, eternal love, overwhelming love. Why? No, why? Because that's the nature of consciousness. You say God is love. You're right, but not the love you're feeling. The love you're feeling is 15th hand. It has to come down from the place of love and make it through you. <laughs> it make it past your thoughts and past your heart. Good luck, okay? Everything has to be exactly the way you want it to be, this, that, right or wrong. That's what's happening. And it's said and done. It's love. Yes, it's love. But boy, it's been through a few filters on the way. And now it's what we call conditional love. What's the condition by you? Conditioned by your views, your opinions, your preferences, your hopes, your dreams, your values, all that stuff, which all made up of your past experiences, okay? If it can make it through that, you'll feel some love. It ain't gonna last, is it? Isn't that terrible? I said it. Okay, why? Because it changes, you change. Nothing is ever going to fit you because it's not you. Or rather, back here, it's all you, okay? That's where it's happening, back here. Okay, so basically you get to the point where you understand what's going on is you are God descended. But boy, did you get lost. I mean, you go, I know I don't have time to talk to you, right? But in, in Genesis, there's this discussion of the fall from the garden. Someday you will be able to read that and understand that's exactly what we just talked about. You're here. It's ecstatic. It's pure bliss all the time. You know what the name for God in yoga is? Sat Chit Ananda. Sat Chit Ananda. Eternal conscious ecstasy. That's what every master found. When they merged back, they were in a state of absolute bliss. That's where Buddha went, Nirvana, same name. All the great ones that got out, there weren't that many <laughs> at all, right? But that's what they said. It's just pure ecstasy. The Sufi dancers, that's a Muslim, Islam, Sufi dancers, they go into ecstasy. The whirling dervishes, they dance, they sing. Oh my God, it's Shakti, it's spirit, call it whatever you want. That is who you are. But you can't be that when you're busy being, you know, there's a line in the Bible where God says, the Lord your God is a jealous God. Was he a therapist? What's, that's not what it means. It means exactly what we just talked about tonight. That it has to be one pointed. If you're busy with you, you can't know God. Why? Because you're busy knowing you. If the light is identified with what it's shining on, it doesn't know it's light. It thinks it's the object it's shining on. So it has to be one-pointed. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, all that, right? Guess what? You do. You just don't know it. <laughs> you're busy having to make the world be a certain way so you can feel some love. Wouldn't it be nice to find out you are love? Your love is always there. Bliss is always there. Joy is always there. Inspiration is always there. Passion is always there. It's what you are. But you can't experience it because you're busy looking at what you're not. You're busy looking at this thing. Okay? 
what I wanted to talk about, and we did, we touched it, right, is the world outside is just what it is. People write me, how do I deal with stuff that's going on? You start with acceptance. What do you mean? I don't accept that. Of course you don't want to accept that because you think that means that it has to be the way you want it to be. If something happens, it happened. You're not going to make it not have happened. Spiritual is very logical. You cannot make what already happened not happen. Therefore, you have to accept it. If you don't accept it, you screw yourself up. Just don't accept one thing, anything. Don't accept what your kid did. Don't accept what your husband did, your wife did. Don't accept how the car in front of you is driving. Don't accept that it's raining when you don't want it to be. See what happens inside of you. It gets ugly, doesn't it? Why? Because the spirit can't flow. You blocked it. It starts with acceptance. But acceptance doesn't mean you'll do anything about it. I'll close off with this. I told you it would. Just because I say I accept that you did this, it's painful to me. I had to hit my stuff. But I accept. Okay, you did this. How do you know? Hey, it is there. You did it. I said, let those eyes to see. Let them see. It's like, there, it happened. All right, now what? I better accept it. Otherwise, what's going to happen is it's going to hit my personal stuff. I am unable to handle my personal stuff, and I'm going to react. Not act. React. Not based on what you did. Based on what happened inside of me because of what you did. And that's not going to fix anything, is it? That's where wars come from. That's where all the stuff comes from. Is I can't handle my inside, so I'm going to try to manipulate and control the outside. All right? And then what happens? You did something. It offended me. So now I hit you or I yelled at you or I threw you out of the house. Okay? What are you doing? You just took the dirtiest part of your being, the stuff that you couldn't handle from before, that you stored inside since you were three, and you just let it run your life. That's not going to work out well, is it? You want to have a nice life? Come from a nice place. So you start with acceptance. Then what? Now I've accepted. This is what happened. Okay. Calm down. It's all right. It's not all right. I'm not going to convince myself to like it because it doesn't fit well within my self-concept. There. Don't do that. That's just a form of suppression. Well, I should be able to handle this. You don't do that. You look at it. You say, this is a mess. It's bothering me. But it happened. And if I express the me that it's bothering, I mess up my relationships. I'm going to mess up everything. You mess up my job. I'm quitting. I can't, I can't believe he didn't like what I did. I can't believe he got the raise. I'm out of here. All right. Well, well, do you have a job? No. Well, which is more important? That you didn't get the raise, you don't have a job. I don't care. I bet you don't. Until you don't have food, until your wife throws you out of the house. Right? You can't do that. So you accept that it happened, because it did, and you can accept that it doesn't feel good inside of you. Whoa, well, what do you mean I accept that? It's what it is. There it is. Okay, you're the consciousness experiencing disturbance. Fine, I don't have to act on that. I don't have to suppress it. I don't have to deny it. I don't do anything. I can just sit there and say, this event happened, and that's one acceptance, and I see that it's causing trouble inside of me. I accept that. I accept that. There. Now what? Now I can come from a more centered position. I can breathe be here and look outside and say, is there anything that I can do to help the situation? Is there anything I can do that will better the situation? That's called serving. Acceptance leads to service. Non-acceptance leads to personal reaction, which is only about serving yourself. But if you can handle it, you can probably help. Help somebody. Help the situation. Do whatever you can to help, right? But come from a clear place. So this is what it means to be a human being. First of all, you're not. People say, I'm only human. You, I mean, that's ridiculous. You are God staring at a human. Okay? And your job, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to learn how to come back to the seat of self while you're interacting with this world, be in the world or not of it, while you're interacting with the world, out of love, out of caring, out of divine consciousness. Interact. I just taught you the entire Bhagavad Gita. I know most of you will never ever read that book. That is all it says. It is not what's going on outside. It's where you're coming from inside. And whatever you come from, you come from the highest place you can and then put your whole heart and soul into serving the outside. Not because you want something, need anything. There's no concept. Of, if you're filled with bliss, you don't need anything. Right? You just, that's such a beautiful life. Every one of you are capable of that. All right. So we touched on some sensitive subjects, right? But the one I like the most is this compassion thing. Buddha said that compassion is the highest human emotion. Why? Now you understand what compassion is. 
I understand why I am the way I am. Therefore, I understand why you are the way you are. And I'm not judging. I have understanding, deep understanding of why things are the way they are. Now I'm in a position I can help because I'm clear of myself. You're clear of the personal self. All right. Work on these things and never forget who you are. You're the highest thing to walk the face of the earth. If you think you're in depression, you're not in depression. You're staring at a depressed part of your being. It's not easy to learn. You can learn to get off, right? But at least know that you're not depressed. You're staring at a psyche that's depressed. That's a big difference, isn't it? Okay? Mm, Jagger diff.